think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I am Erin Quinn Valcho, and I am the museum curator for the city of Lacey. And I am so delighted that you are all here to join us on our very first virtual event in our History Talk speaker series. Um, before we get into the reason why we're all here to talk, hear Shanna talk about suffrage, uh, I'm gonna fill everybody in on a little bit of museum news. And if you have come to our speaker series before, before all this craziness and we used to meet in City Hall, um, then you will know that we have um, a new museum educator. And so I would like to introduce to you Albert McConathy, who is going to tell you a little bit about himself. And um, we are so glad to have him on our team. So Albert, if you wanna come share a little bit about yourself to everyone. Hi, uh, as Aaron said, I'm Albert McConathy. I uh, am formerly the, um, I was the assistant manager of the Natural History Museum for the Evergreen State College. I was also a natural history fellow at the Natural History Museum there. Um, I really love, I have a passion for uh, regular history too, instead of natural history. Uh, I worked a little bit with the natural uh, world and history through the Heritage Tree Program in Portland. And um, I have a passion for conservation too. Uh, I volunteer a lot for Capital Land Trust. Um, I'm really excited to be working for the museum as the educator. It's a very interesting and amazing opportunity that I've stumbled upon and I really appreciate it and look forward to seeing people at the museum when it reopens. Thank you, Albert. Um, we're so glad to have you. And um, what a crazy time you came at. Like, what was it, a week and a half before we were all shut down? Yeah, everybody was doing fist bumps, no handshakes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's been an interesting new job. All right, well, thank you. Um, so after this History Talks, Albert will take over from me. But today, we're going to show him the ropes. <laughs> all right. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, upcoming events at the museum. Well, not at the museum, but with the museum. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So our next program is, um, our speaker is gonna be Eric Ebel, who is the chair of the Lacey Historical Commission. And he is going to be sharing history of the Medicine Creek Treaty and his journey to find the treaty tree. That program, program is going to take place at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, October 20th. You can register for that program online just the way that you did for tonight's program on our website at laceymuseum.org and then click on events. And we hope you'll join us for what is sure to be a very interesting discussion. I know I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I know that people are wondering when will the museum be open? I am too. <laughs> um, right now, uh, we are, since we are under the city of Lacey umbrella, um, we are doing what is in line with all of the city facilities other than city hall. Right now, the decision has been made that we are gonna continue to be closed through October. Um, we sort of have been making a decision you know, on a case by case basis. We just wanna do what's best for the public. We have a very small facility and we wanna make sure that we're, you know, doing our, our best and be right by everyone. But although we are closed, um, both Albert and I are working um, our regular schedules. And so we're here to help you um, with anything history related. So if you wanna look at a photo or research something, or have a burning question, we'll do our best to help you um, with your issue. Um, we are also working on a project to document the history that we're all going through. And it's called Collecting COVID, a History Project. And we're asking people if they will submit their photos and share what they've been doing during this pandemic. And these images will become a part of a virtual exhibit and hopefully as well as an in-person exhibit when we get to that point again. Here are a couple of examples of submission. 
the one on the left might be my own submission. Um, it's my daughter and I at the Point Defiant Zoo with our animal zoo masks. And then the one on the right is submitted by Kimberly Girock. I hope I'm saying that right. And it's, um, she was very early in the pandemic taking her yoga class virtually, but was having trouble because her very furry friend here had other ideas for her exercise that day. Um, so please send us your submissions. We would love to hear about them. If you go to lacymuseum.org, the link to submit your photos is right there on the front page. The last thing I wanted to share before we get started is probably what I get asked about the most, the new museum project. You probably already noticed that the recreation of the historic train depot has gone up at Pacific Avenue. And there is an adjacent train themed pl playground that is being installed. And we were hoping it was gonna be um, completed this fall. We had some delays in parts due to the pandemic and some other issues. And if we can get four straight days of no rain, then we can get our surface done and get the playground installed and it will be installed this fall. If not, well, you know how Washington weather is, it'll probably be next spring. <laughs> so I'm crossing our fingers and hoping that it will be open soon. So all of the fencing will come down once that happens and it will be open to the public. All right. So the depot and the playground are a part of what will become the whole museum campus. We are currently in the design development phase of this project, which was made possible by a grant from the State Historical Society. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of the renderings of the new museum um, as the design currently stands. Construction documents should be ready by early next year. So this is a view from uh, what would become the parking lot. Um, the depot would be behind us and to the left. And on this slide is a bigger view, so it's just pulled back a little bit. You could see the depot there. Um, I wish I had time to show you all of the drawings because it's really exciting and looks very cool. So we have written another grant uh, to help fund the site preparation, including taking down um, an existing building that's on the site. And we'll find out if we get that next year. And if we do, that work will begin in the fall of 2021. And I'll be glad to take more questions on the museum project at the end if anyone has them. Speaking of questions, um, if you have them, you can put them in the Q&A box that should be there at the bottom of your screen and we will uh, handle them mostly at the end. Um, Shanna would prefer to wait till the end. So we will um, have a nice Q&A session after she is done with her, I'm sure will be terrific program. Um, all right, now on to the reason we are all here. So I'm gonna introduce Shanna. Shanna is a local historian, longtime local historian in our region. She uh, graduated from Gonzaga University and she holds a master's degree in public administration from the Evergreen State College. She worked in historic preservation for many years before becoming the coordinator of the Women's History Consortium at the Washington State Historical Society. And now retired, she is an independent historian and we are delighted to have her with us today. Well, good evening. I'm delighted to be here uh, this evening and share with you some suffrage history uh, of our area. As the territorial and state capital, Olympia and Thurston County were central to the history of women's right to vote. Activist women gained the vote and women were and continue to be leaders in all levels of governments, communities and tribes. The first women's rights convention held at Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 was a public call for voting rights for women. The convention of men and women accepted the Declaration of Sentiments and then adopted a series of resolutions as remedies for the unequal treatment of women. Suffrage was arguably the most controversial of the Declaration's wide variety of indictments and demands. The convention affirmed the resolution that it is the duty of women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. As a territory, Washington could enact voter qualifications by legislative action. 
In 1854, a mere six years after the first Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, the first Washington Territorial Legislature considered enacting women's suffrage. House member Arthur Denny introduced an amendment for women's suffrage to a pending voting bill, and the amendment failed by only one vote. Some of the most active early suffragists came with the Mercer parties in the 1860s, which brought Eastern women to the area, several to Olympia. They threw off the shackles of Eastern law and were in the forefront of activism for women's votes. One of those was Mehetable Elder. Remember, here come the brides. Well, it was really, here come the suffragists. Following the enactment of the laws in Washington Territory and the post-Civil War U.S. constitutional amendments regarding the rights of citizens, some Thurston County women determined to go to the polls without waiting for legislative action to empower them to vote. In 1870, 15 women led by Charlotte Emily Only French at Wright cast their ballots and had them accepted at Grand Mound in Little Rock or Black River. Women who tried to vote in Olympia were turned away at the polls, including Mary Only Brown at left, Jane Pattison and Jane Wiley. Another woman, Susan Doffelmeyer, was taken away by her husband. This incident did not permanently change the landscape for women's suffrage in Washington, but it was a potent action, which is recorded in national histories of women securing the right to vote. In 1871, the national suffragist Susan B. Anthony came to the Northwest, accompanied by activist Abigail Scott Dunaway from Oregon. Anthony addressed a meeting at the Good Templars Hall in Olympia on October 17th, with proceeds going to the victims of the Chicago fire. Anthony also visited the Bigelow House in Olympia, which still stands. In her diary, she recounted dining at the house and she called Mrs. Bigelow splendid. Both Daniel and Anne Elizabeth White Bigelow were strong suffragists. Both Anthony and Dunaway spoke before the territorial legislature in session meeting at the Old Wooden Capitol, which was on the present day Capitol grounds. Well, inspired local suffragists called for an 1871 Women's Voting Rights Convention to be held in Olympia, and they used their own names. And you can see Mary Only Brown, Anne Elizabeth Bigelow, and others there. One of those was Margaret Stewart White Ruddle. She was Ann Elizabeth White Bigelow's mother. A widow, uh, she married Stephen Ruddle in 1857 and they later uh, lived near the Bigelows. Meeting at the Good Templars Hall where Anthony had spoken earlier, the group created the Washington Territory Women's Suffrage Association an important infrastructure for women's suffrage advocacy. After coming close in 1881, in 1883, the legislature enacted women's right to vote in Washington territory. The celebration included the booming of cannons and ringing of bells and a gathering at what was then the Columbia Hall in Olympia. Only women in Wyoming and Utah had the right to vote before Washington women after the Civil War. After women gained the right to vote, they registered and voted. These early Olympia voter registers are now transcribed and available online through state archives. On this page in 1883 are both Anne Elizabeth Bigelow and her mother, Margaret Ruddle. The question is sometimes asked, did African-American women gain the ballot in Washington in the 1880s? 
They did, they registered and voted in Washington. This is Margaret Howard, who is listed on the Olympia voter registration rolls. An African-American, she was the daughter-in-law of Rebecca Howard, an early Olympia businesswoman who was featured on a large mural in downtown. They also began jury service. In Olympia in December, 1884, the first women on a pettit jury were Mrs. E.T. Munson, Mary Only Brown at left, Mrs. Hepzibah Sylvester in the center, and Mrs. P.D. Ballard. First women grand jury members were Ella Stork at right and Mrs. F.E. Drake. While reflecting concern about women serving on juries when they gained the right to vote, lawsuits were brought to invalidate the suffrage law. In 1887, the Territorial Supreme Court revoked suffrage in a suit brought by a gambler indicted by a grand jury that included women, saying that the title of the 1883 Act and its amendatory version of 1886 did not reflect the content of the legislation. In 1888, the Washington legislature reenacted the suffrage law with an appropriate title and the measure excluded women from serving on juries. <clears throat> However, that same year, the territorial Supreme Court decided another suffrage case. They ruled that the federal government had intended to put the word male before citizenship in the Washington Territory Organic Act when establishing voter qualifications, taking away the right of women to vote literally with one stroke of the pen. Washington was poised to become a state in 1889 and the Constitutional Convention was held in Olympia that summer. The disqualification of women from voting weakened the cause of suffrage since they could not vote for delegates to the convention. There was a concerted effort to include women's suffrage in the body of the constitution, which was ratified, but women's suffrage was a separate issue on the ballot and lost by a substantial margin, as did another ballot issue, prohibition. Washington came into the union as a non-women's suffrage state, but were women robbed of the vote? Before statehood, there was not a secret ballot and each party printed and distributed the ballots. On some ballots seen here, for women's suffrage was already crossed out. Although women could not vote generally, they chose the state flower in the 1890s. Washington was invited to participate in the 1893 Chicago Columbian Exposition and the display was to feature a state flower and the state didn't have one. So women were called upon to select the flower at balloting places, including post offices and here at a drugstore in Olympia. When the votes were totaled, the rhododendron had won. In 1959, the legislature chose the rhododendron macrophyllium as the species for the state flower, which remains today. After statehood, gaining women's suffrage was more difficult. A constitutional amendment required a two thirds vote of each house of the legislature and statewide ratification. The fusionist and populist reformers in the 1897 state legislature passed a bill for a statewide vote to amend the Washington, Con Washington Constitution for women's suffrage. Despite work by suffrage groups statewide, the ratification vote on the amendment lost by almost 10,000 votes the following year. The voting men feared women would enact prohibition, which they did once they attained the vote. The Washington suffrage movement was in the doldrums around the turn of the 20th century, but by 1909, there was a reinvigorated movement headed by two major leaders, May Arkwright Hutton and Emma Smith DeVoe, and they used a modern campaign that we would recognize today. They believed in building coalitions. They conducted a low key campaign. They separated themselves from prohibition. They were very organized. 
They use modern media. They published a cookbook and they monitored the election. The amendment passed the legislature in 1909, but ratification would be in 1910 since we didn't have statewide elections yearly at that time. And the cartoonists had a field day. They showed all the suffragists wearing great big hats, carrying rolling pins about a foot taller than all the men. And they said only good looking men can expect to hold office when the bill becomes law. The Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition was held in Seattle in the summer of 1909 on the present day UW campus. Seattle was the site for a national suffragist convention as well. And this was the kickoff for the Washington campaign. Some suffragists were also mountaineers showing they were strong enough to vote. They put a votes for women banner in Columbia Crest atop Mount Rainier. The cookbook was a fundraiser with cogent arguments for women's voting rights and early 1900s food ways, but it would persuade the men who would vote on the amendment that dinner would still be on the table. And you can find that Washington Women's Cookbook online. It's pretty interesting to look at. At a local gathering for a baseball team in Lacey in 1910, Mr. Hunnamer declared himself for equal voting rights. Washington women knew the correct tactics for a suffrage victory. They were low key, they were reasoned, and they let men know they wanted to vote. They said it was a matter of justice. Here you can see part of their media campaign that included putting up posters. Two active suffragists were sisters Eunice and Frances Sylvester, originally from South Bay. Frances, a local teacher, was an officer in the Equality Club of Olympia and active in the Olympia Businesswoman's Booster Club for suffrage. Eunice, who for a time owned the art store in Olympia, worked with Frances in putting up posters as part of the poster brigades. Frances ran for Olympia City office county superintendent of schools and state uh, superintendent of public instruction. The campaign had diverse supporters. Noted journalist and leader, Susie Revels Caton of Seattle was an associate editor of the Seattle Republican that advocated for women's suffrage. The big brain men of Washington, as the suffragists called them, voted to share political power with the women of Washington, ratifying the amendment in November 1910 by a wide margin. And again, the cartoonists uh, wanted to portray this was how men got to the polls. The amendment read, there shall be no denial of the elective franchise at any election on account of sex. Washington was the five-star suffrage state, just the fifth state in the union to permanently enact women's suffrage and the first state in 14 years. They joined their sisters in Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho. But it's important to note that not all women gained the vote. Native Americans generally were not citizens until 1924. Immigrant Asians had citizenship restrictions Voters were required to read and speak English. However, African-American women gained the ballot in Washington in 1910. With new voting rights, women again served on juries. The first all women jury in the state after the suffrage vote was in Olympia in December, 1910, and it gained national publicity. This panel is on display now at the Thurston County Courthouse. The jurors were left to right Ada Mowell, Bernice Sapp, Reverend Ginevra Lake, Jean McLeod, and not shown is the fifth juror, Sadie Bauer Blakesley. They were called the all suffragist jury. 
And this is what happened when Ma serves on the jury. Um, things don't go so well at home. After women regained the vote, they also ran for public office. The first two women elected to the legislature in 1912 were Nina Jolliden Croak from Pierce County and Frances Axtell from Bellingham. They began their service in 1913. Josephine Corliss Preston was the first woman elected to statewide office in 1912 as superintendent of public instruction, although women could be county superintendents of schools much earlier. Once women gained the right to vote, they helped other women gain the vote. In fact, the National Council of Women Voters was headquartered in Tacoma. Well, prohibition passed in Washington in 1914, effective 1916, four years before national prohibition. World War I divided suffragists. More militant women picketed the White House and some were arrested and even force fed. Other women worked in home front activities to show their citizenship. The 1918 flu stymied mass protests and many women worked as they do now as nurses and supporting both the victims of the flu and war work. Recent scholarship is putting this into perspective. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Well, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution for Women's Suffrage passed Congress in June 1919 and 36 states were needed to ratify at the time. Then Governor uh, Lewis Hart of Washington was in a difficult position. He had to call a special legislative session to ratify the amendment since the regular session had adjourned for 1919 and Washington legislators met only every two years at the time. He delayed, but finally called a special session for March 1920 at the old Capitol. The suffrage resolution was introduced by Frances Haskell of Pierce County, one of only two women serving in the legislature, along with Anna Caldwell of Snohomish County. Longtime suffragist Emma Smith DeVoe and Carrie Hill also addressed the legislature. The resolution passed unanimously and Washington became the 35th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Tennessee was the 36th and final state needed to ratify in August 1920. Famously, it was a young legislator in Tennessee, Harry Byrne, who changed his vote on the advice of his mother. The amendment became effective August 26, 1920, so this is the 100th anniversary of the ratification nationally, but it will be the 110th anniversary of women's voting rights in Washington in November. The amendment reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation, but there was more work to do. Not all women gained the vote in the 1880s and 1910 in Washington or after the 19th Amendment. As noted, most Native Americans were not citizens until 1924. Immigrant Asians were precluded from citizenship until the mid 20th century. Women could lose their citizenship through marriage to a non-citizen in the first part of the 20th century. Women in US territories were also delayed from voting. African Americans and others were often barred from voting by structural racism addressed by the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s. 18 year old voting was enacted in the 1970s, but the quest for equality and voting rights continues today. Nevertheless, the 19th Amendment was a landmark event for women nationally to take their place as equals in the political life of the country. Well, because of COVID, in lieu of an in-person commemoration in August, 
the Washington State Historical Society sponsored the production of an online presentations as a suffrage special around the state. To learn more, see the Washington State Historical Society Facebook page and Olympia was one of the sites featured. Thank you, Shanna, that was awesome. Well, so far we don't have any questions, but I've got one. Okay. Um, when you were researching this topic, what do you think was the most surprising thing that you found out? Well, I, I think it's, it's surprising uh, what a grassroots movement it was. Um, and as I, I mentioned, a couple of, uh, of women from the Lacey area, there were many in Olympia. So it was a very bottom up movement and every community had active suffragists. And I also uh, learned, uh, I think, uh, how important it was for the Washington campaign to be successful, that the women knew the right arguments to use. And they um, un understood it was uh, things like the cookbook, saying that it was a matter of justice that women got the vote. Those kinds of arguments really resonated with the men who would be voting on the amendment. So um, also I was surprised to learn how late in the process Washington uh, ratified the 19th Amendment. So they were the second to the last state uh, to ratify, which is surprising because we were an early voting state, but there were a variety of reasons uh, why, why that happened. Um, oh, I didn't realize that that was because of our choice. I just sort of assumed when I read it that it was some sort of order, but it wasn't? No, it, it was, uh, each state had to decide when to call a legislative session. And so people are often surprised uh, about Washington being, being the second to the last yeah. state. And um, so that, that was surprising. And there's a lot of reasons why that are kind of technical, but um, there was a lot of lobbying by national and state suffragists for the governor to call this special session uh, which uh, he, he took his time doing. Another question we've got here is, was the right to vote in Washington wider than nationally from 1920 through 1950? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that means. I did want to say that when women in Washington got the right to vote in 1910, they could vote for uh, their members of Congress and uh, from Washington and the president. So uh, that was part of the reason why uh, the voting women of the West formed um, this organization to advocate for other women to get the right to vote because they were effective lobbyists uh, voting uh, since they could vote. So when they went to Washington, D.C., they were listened to because they were voters for Congress and the president. Um, I am not sure what the numbers, uh, as far as I no, um, there aren't uh, good uh, numbers about the numbers of women and men um, who voted. So it's not uh, separated out by women and men as far as I know. Yeah, that would be hard to figure out. Interesting question though. Maybe someone's thesis. <laughs> All right, um, we have another question here. After the 1910 vote, did this change the type of legislation that promoted women's rights or was it still focused on issues that affected men? It made a big difference. Um, there began to be organizations that were very interested in advocating for uh, issues that were of interest to uh, women and children. Of course, this was coupled with the progressive movement. So we got uh, lots of things that were um, uh, related to that. Um, they had the eight hour day for women. Um, the age of consent was raised. Um, there was a movement to get equal pay for men and women teachers. Um, uh, women's pensions uh, uh, for if they were indigent was brought into uh, the forefront. So um, there, it was really a lot about more addressing issues that were of interest uh, to women and children and elections changed. They became more issue oriented and there were uh, groups that got together and 
began to um, ask candidates what their positions were on issues. And so um, the election process um, became more what we would know today, uh, more issue oriented. Interesting. So as a follow up to that, did this allow women's women the right to own or inherit property? Did that have any effect on that? Well, we had um, in Washington, we were an early community property territory dating from 1869. So women in, and I uh, associate that with early voting rights in, in Washington because we had community property in, in yeah. Washington very, very early on. And so that was uh, uh, part of what was very different out here in the West because often in the East, there were a lot of uh, restrictions that had been built up over time for women's rights um, and, and owning property and that sort of thing. And um, when they moved out here to uh, Little Washington Territory, uh, women didn't have those kinds of restrictions because those laws had not been put in place. So uh, since we've been a community property territory and state for, for so long, um, and in fact, if in the earliest uh, Euro American settlement, uh, when people took out donation land claim, uh, uh, they could get free land for settling in the area. Women claimed land, they, most of those show what part of the donation land claim belongs to the wife and what belongs to the husband. So um, I think that uh, accounts a lot for the early voting rights in Washington was this ability to have property rights. Yeah, that really surprised me when I first started doing research on that to find out that women could get half of that donation land claim. All right, we've got another question here. We've got some really smart people in our audience asking some really great questions. Can you speak to the role that church and religious leaders played nationally and or locally in the suffrage movement? Well, it, it, it varied. Um, some, uh, some ministers uh, were, were more open to women's right, voting rights. Uh, one of the factors uh, was that um, ministers and others felt that if women got the right to vote, they might vote in prohibition. And so they were supportive uh, for that reason. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, once women in Washington gained the vote in 1910, Washington got prohibition earlier than, than nationally. So it, it really depended. Uh, there were some ministers that were very much opposed to it. Others, others were not. Okay. Um, so you touched on something that really has struck me, which is the parallels from then to now, what with the, the pandemic and protests. And can you go into that a little bit more about when you were researching this, kind of like what came to mind in that? Well, I, I think, um, and it's important to delineate Washington from what I described for the 19th Amendment, because Washington was not a place where there were a lot of demonstrations and picketing and that sort of thing. They decided on a low key campaign. And as I mentioned, I think they were very effective because they understood what would appeal to, uh, to male voters. That mm -hmm. having been said, I think the activism of, of women uh, campaigning for the right to vote, um, you can draw a straight line from activism for change to what we see today. And um, I think uh, there's been some really interesting recent scholarship, as I mentioned, uh, about the role of women during the flu uh, pandemic of 1918 and, and how that influenced um, national uh, feelings about voting rights. But they were in the same position as we are today, wearing masks and, and that sort of thing. And as I mentioned, there was quite a division. There were um, suffragists who said, we need to really draw back from campaigning for women's right to vote. We need to be really supportive of the war effort, show that we're, we're, we're strong citizens. And then others, as I mentioned, uh, picketed the White House and, and uh, really talked about uh, fighting in World War one for rights in Europe when women here at home did not have equal voting rights. So um, 
there were a lot of strategies used. And um, I think the bottom line though, is it took activism. It took women initiating um, the, the uh, campaign for voting rights. Um, the women, especially in Olympia during the territorial period were, were very active. I mentioned Mary Olney Brown several times, but she was um, uh, very active. And of course, with the territorial legislature meeting here in Olympia, and the opportunity to secure voting rights through pieces of legislation, um, it, it was a, a big uh, opportunity and uh, women took advantage of it and they weren't afraid. As I mentioned, they, uh, they called this uh, suffrage convention and they used their own names. They didn't use their husband's names uh, generally and they participated in the convention and they formed organizations and uh, they wrote about why women should have the right to vote. So um, I think we can talk about activism aside from picketing and that sort of thing. The activism was to keep the pressure on, to, to uh, see that, we're, that women were citizens, they had the right to vote and um, to help uh, the male legislators and voters see that that was important. Right. And um, you talked about this too, but if you had anything more to add about the um, impact that Washington's vote had on the national scene, I found that really interesting too. Well, as I mentioned, we're just the fifth state where women um, permanently had the right to vote. And didn't and it sort of reinvigorate? It did. It had been 14 years since any state had enacted women's voting rights. And so uh, the succeeding states used a lot of the same strategies that were used here in Washington. And I know from studying uh, at state archives, uh, the governor's papers, um, it was often uh, the governors during uh, in that early period were often called upon to to make statements, how is, how is women's voting working in Washington? Uh, do we need to be afraid of it in our state? And uh, almost you know, they, uniformly, they said it worked just fine and, and things were going fine in Washington. And so um, it was uh, from west to east and it was a, a, a lot of a state by state process and then it became the efforts for the federal amendment. So it wouldn't take so long for a state by state process. Okay, great. Well, it looks like we're out of questions here. We did have somebody give a comment and say that they thought it was great and really learned a lot. I did too. Um, Albert, have you got any questions for Shanna before we sign off here? Oh, I was... Um... I was just thinking about the uh, the words that the su the suffragists had for the legislators calling them big brained. I was wondering what the impetus was behind the the moniker. Well, I think it was um, the suffragists were very quick to thank the men of Washington. Uh, you know, when you think about it, they voted to share their political power, which is it's a big deal. And um, that was uh, just something that they, they, uh, they said that men here in the West have bigger brains evidently because they are willing to vote for women's uh, voting rights. So it, it was a compliment and uh, uh, there was a lot of um, effort by the suffragists to acknowledge what a big step it was. Great. All right, well, I think that closes us out for today. Thank you everyone so much for joining. We've got a couple of more comments that have come in about how great it was. So thank you, Shanna, for your terrific presentation. I hope everyone will join us for our presentation next month on the Treaty Tree. And we hope you enjoyed this. And if so, please tell your friends and we'll keep doing it. So thanks everybody. Bye.